Mini episode 1361 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode 1361. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris here, and we're still a slight ways out in the FDH Lounge when we do our annual college football preview, but we have brought in the gentleman that we always have for that. We brought him in a little bit early because this has been an utterly seismic summer in NCAA football, and uh, it will affect other sports as well, obviously, but football is the biggest uh, money generator, even with everything that March Madness brings in. The three different things of radical conference realignment, the beginnings of which I think we're only seeing at this time, the likely expansion of the college football playoff to 12 teams, and name image likeness, the fact that college football players can now openly go out there and make a whole boatload of money while they are in school and essentially benefit from their quote-unquote, amateur athletic status. So for all of this and more uh, to break down, good friend of ours, uh, Franz Stuckberry from R Sports Central, and uh, somebody that uh, we now consider part of our FDH Lounge family, one of our dignitaries here in the FDH Lounge. Uh, Fran, it's a pleasure to have you back on, as always, my man, and uh, so much to talk about, about a truly revolutionary period in college football. That word gets thrown around a lot, but it truly applies to the summer of 2021. I mean, it's going to be like dominoes, Rick. We'll, we'll see you over the next couple of weeks and, and months what's next. First, we have Oklahoma and Texas join the SEC. And the biggest reason why yes. it's all about the Benjamins, it's all about the money, it's all about the TV contracts, and all about making as much money as possible. Yes, and that is uh, the through line of everything we're talking about here today. The three big subjects all relate to money and the determination of all parties to cash in on it as much as possible. And again, this likely bodes the downfall of the Big 12, whether they stick around as a shell of themselves or not. But essentially, uh, the Big 12 was formed out of the core of the old Big 8 and the Southwestern Conference, both of which went away in the 90s, and we're going to see the same thing happen here as Oklahoma and Texas. They are, of course, the big daddies by far financially in that conference, and what this kicks off is something with ramifications that we can't even begin to imagine right now, Fran, because other conferences have to catch up. They have to try. The SEC already starts from a leadership position as far as depth of great teams, money involved, the Big Ten has a lot of money as well, but if the Big Ten or anybody else wants to keep up, and I can't see how anybody outside of the Big Ten can even come close to keeping up with the SEC at this point, there is a lot of work to be done and a lot more revolutionary changes on the landscape to follow. It definitely is, Rick. I mean, and the thing is, I, I'll be honest with you, Rick, I don't, I don't expect us to see much more you know, um, moves over the next couple months. Yes. It, may be, it may probably hit the back burner during the college football season, but then pick up. Uh, maybe after again, because the team's not going to just jump the ship and, and run all over the place right now. I can't right. see it happening. This, unless, it, unless it's another situation where something was worked on for months behind. How they kept that quiet, Rick, I give them a lot of credit. They kept it quiet. They kept their mouth shut. There were no leaks. How's that happen in the sports industry, Rick? How's the hell that happen? Yeah, it never happens. It's remarkable. I mean, and I think a lot of us probably had the same thoughts when it came out, like, oh, this might happen, and you're thinking, well, there's a lot to go from here to there, you know, because that's usually how it goes, or you're thinking maybe it's just a trial balloon. No, it was announced when it was basically a done deal. And, yeah, how they kept it secret all this time, I tell you what, everybody in the Big 12 is feeling very, very burned, and they are now directing some of their anger, and I understand it. At ESPN, there was a cease and desist that went out because they're saying that you know, ESPN, acting on behalf of some of the other conferences that they televise, 
was basically setting the stage for the remaining Big 12 teams to be poached. And uh, again, it's a real conflict of interest position. They're reporting on a story that they're squarely in the middle of, you know, and then it, it just, I, I, and again, I don't watch a lot of their debate shows and a lot of their kind of, you know, gaga type programming these days, but I've seen enough clips to know that they're doing exactly what you'd expect them to do, which is, oh, there's so much money in the college football landscape. That's what's driving this. And they're playing innocent about the fact that they are bestowing the money and that they are the big kingmakers in this scenario. Well, the thing is, uh, you know, it's just going to, it's just going to, but the thing is, ESPN's going to end up, end up, uh, having to spend more money uh, for the SEC contract. Plus, so just going to get more ratings with college game day. And, and the thing is, ESPN is a money maker. I mean, come on, Rick. They're the, they're the most expensive channel on our, on our, on our, on our cable bills. They are. Absolutely. And uh, they ain't going to get any cheaper after this, I'll tell you that. And uh, we're seeing scenarios here. Uh, and there were some very, very fevered things getting thrown out in the immediate aftermath of this. And now cooler heads are prevailing, and you don't hear as much talk about this. But of the SEC potentially uh, maybe trying to throw a couple of death blows to the ACC by maybe coming after Clemson and Florida State, certainly that would be enough to, to do that and to really put the ACC on their heels. Some talk about the Big Ten and what they have to offer as far as potentially, could we see, because some of these bigger conferences will probably be going to, you know, I don't know why people are calling them pods instead of divisions, but four-team pods, maybe a Western pod of, for example, Washington, Oregon, USC, Arizona State. These are things we never thought we'd see in our lifetimes, Fran, and now they're being bandied about because, again, if, if a conference like the Big Ten, and they're truly at this point the only one that has any chance in hell of keeping pace with the SEC, uh, it's either grow or die in this climate, and growing means doing extraordinarily radical things, geography be damned. Well, we have to wonder, for Rick, I mean, what do you think is the best option for the mayor of the Big 12 teams? Do they merge with the Pac-12, or do they maybe go to the, uh, or maybe they merge with the American Athletic Conference, which has some quality teams, quality programs, and ESPN... Yes, and I'll tell you what, and that's the funny thing, and they'd have to really swallow uh, their... their their lunch to go with uh, the AC and uh, stay on ESPN. But you know what? I'm predicting that's the only choice they're going to have because the Pac-12, let us not forget, they're very, very snooty about academic standards, and a lot of the remaining schools in the Big 12 do not qualify based on the Pac-12 standards here. Now, you would still look at things like uh, TCU being in, uh, I believe, the Dallas area. Dallas would certainly be an attractive market for the Pac-12 to have, you would think. Kansas is going to be at least somewhat attractive to any conference, uh, whether it be the Pac-12, the Big Ten, etc., just because the, the basketball program is a top five money maker. So even though in college basketball is dwarfed by college football, at least they're they're big in the second biggest sport. So there's a lot of considerations here. But at the end of the day, I think forming what's going to be just a very large mid-major. I hate to say with the AAC. I think that's all they're going to be able to do. They'll be very lucky to hang on to their Big Five designation when it's all said and done. Yeah, that's definitely true. And also, uh, another Baylor with the you know winning that uh, national championship in college basketball might be a, might be, be yes. another appeal for, for for a conference to pick them up. Yes, and they have a, a football program that has done uh, sporadically well uh, over the years as well, and uh, is a, apparently growing again. So. There are some options there, but nothing that is going to keep them at the level of relevancy that they were at with Oklahoma and Texas there. And uh, again, uh, the AACC, which uh, at this point you could say arguably is uh, the third biggest uh, conference at this point, but they've got the SEC right in their backyard. So what do they do to try to keep pace here? Who are they able to poach uh, realistically? Nobody. Yeah, Nobody. I mean, they already... Because they're thinking... They, Rick, I mean, I mean, Notre Dame's not going to join any conference. They want that TV. They get. They want to keep the TV contract. Why would they want to share it with the conference? Exactly, and uh, I understand they're setting up their own streaming service for things like practices and the spring game and stuff like that. And right now, I guess they're not charging for it, but they might down the road. And uh, Notre Dame. Uh, inevitably at some point, could even, uh, if, if things fell out with NBC, take that in-house, but that's well down the road. In the more near term, they are so locked in with NBC that this is something I saw just in the last day or so. Their first game is actually going to be, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a game against Toledo, 
Peacock exclusive for the first time ever, they're going to have a game that you're going to need Peacock to watch. So they're they're so glued in with NBC at this point uh, that, uh, yeah, it's hard to imagine them uh, giving into the allure of any conference. And realistically, they can't join any conference but the ACC because the deal, that the limited deal that they have with them, they'd have to pay a huge penalty fee to go join the Big Ten or somebody else. So it's AAC, or I'm sorry, ACC or nobody. And I agree with you, Fran. It's probably nobody as far as them joining up with for at least the next 10, 15 years. Yeah, but look, Rick, let's talk about um, Texas and Oklahoma for a second. Mm-hmm. I think Oklahoma can can have some success in the SEC, but I don't, Texas is a long shot at best. I know they have Steve Sarkees and all the SEC ties, but can, can Texas ever get um, develop as much talent and uh, compete with the tough teams in the SEC? I mean, let's just hope when they do come back, they get to, they get to play Texas A&M on a regular basis. Well, yes, and uh, A&M, of course, didn't want them in there. That's the politics of the situation. They wanted to be the only team in the Lone Star State that was in the SEC, and now that's gone, and they're not as special in that way. And, uh, yeah, the way they draw up these pods is going to be very interesting. But this takes us to uh, another one of the big stories of the summer here, and that Texas, they are going to be well-poised in one way on the forthcoming landscape, Fran, and that is with, again, as many deep-pocketed alums as they have, and that's what allows them to do some of the big buyouts that they've had of unsuccessful coaches and the like. Competing in the era of name-image likeness where, let's face it, what some of this stuff is right now is just legalized kickbacks to the players. I've heard of things like players at certain schools are doing endorsement deals for local gyms. Well, that's just a booster who's, you know, paying money to the players there, who's probably looking at it like, if I get any good publicity for my gym, it's a bonus. This is just a legal way to pay the players. So in an atmosphere where it's legal to pay players, uh, I'm just going to be cynical about this, Texas should be poised for a comeback based on nothing other than that. Yeah, because uh, all over the place, you know, all the boosters, the sponsors, these boosters have businesses. These boosters have restaurants. They'll, they'll let their... I mean, I guarantee you, so now with these deals, some of these players are just going to, they're going to let them eat at these restaurants wherever they want, yep. as long as they, they match their social media, Rick. Yep. I mean, actually, if you have followings, I mean, look at some, look at some of the followings, like the, the Alabama quarterback. Um, you're, um, the Alabama quarterback, he already has a million dollars in endorsements already, and he hasn't played one down, Rick. Right. Oh, yeah. A million dollars, uh, you know, Saban was smart to let that slip at the SEC media days because that is a good recruiting tool come here and this is one more advantage that you can have if you're part of our system and you know I look at it also like I was talking about this actually with my brother and we were kind of laughing about this like imagine if you're a booster and you own some kind of huge company that's not at all dependent on advertising maybe it's an industrial company or something like that you can still quote unquote hire the star quarterback to endorse your company and again your company doesn't need advertising. Maybe you've never advertised before. Maybe you don't. Again, maybe your company doesn't need it, but you can pay somebody to endorse your company. Again, it's legalized kickbacks to players. This is a loophole that you could drive an 18 wheeler through. And again, the schools with the huge alumni bases, as always, it's always a matter in life of the rich get richer. And as far as the top programs in college football, Who's going to benefit most from name, image, likeness? It's going to be the ones with the longest lines of deep-pocketed alums just ready to legally shove players uh, all this money instead of giving them the $50 uh, handshakes over the years, allegedly. And, 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 uh, and let's, talk about, let's talk about the Ohio State quarterback, Evers. Yes. Uh, who, who's leading it, um, after his junior year, but he does have enough credits to graduate. But he wants to you know, leaving. He's going to be holding a clipboard for a couple of years, but... But guess what? He'll be making money when he holds that clipboard. Exactly. And the thing of it is, is uh, for a kid that I have seen as potentially uh, the highest ranked incoming recruited quarterback since Trevor Lawrence, uh, he may end up playing this year. And that's a thing where you go to look at it and uh, it's really going to be uh, something that's going to turn the entire program on its ear. And, and again, imagine being the coaches, you know, the entire off season you've been planning for probably this guy or this guy uh, to come in and uh, take the place, uh, uh, you know, at quarterback this year. And now it ends up being the guy you thought was coming in in 2022, but I'm sure they're not complaining. Uh, well, that's, a, that's a long shot, Matt, because he hasn't even, um, you know, um, you know 
OTAs or practices. That's all. He should be holding the clipboard. He's like fourth behind the depth chart from what I what I read recently. So it's just he hasn't. Even, so that's that's. I mean, and Ohio State has probably run, like around six quarterbacks. I mean, yeah. The only kind of half thing. A bunch of the half those quarterbacks are going to transfer after they after. They name a starter. I mean, we've seen that happen in college football. And now with name, image, and likeness, these universities are going to say, hey, we'll give you all these spot, these sponsorships and deals if you can transfer us. It's, a, it's a, another way to get to get players to transfer to other schools, right? That is a great point. And I will say that you're, you're probably right about this. He won't start at least at the outset for all the reasons that you pointed out. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he might just be an injury away from – you know, maybe in October or November coming in for the stretch run and maybe being Cardale Jones part two and leading this team further. And, uh, yeah, you're, you're going to see more of this. You're going to see kids who, uh, because now it's not a matter where you have to wait until the pros to make money. You can start making money in college, and that's the thing. You're going to see kids uh, trying to uh, jump their eligibility up and, so uh, this won't be the last time that this happens. Happening in this climate with name image likeness having just passed, this kid is the pioneer of this movement, but he will not be uh, the last one to do it. But yeah, I mean, this is going to change the landscape in ways that we can't even imagine. And, and it again, also, it also resulted in kind of like being able to transfer it. It mm-hmm. also resulted in free agency. Yep. Absolutely. And the transfer portal, as you say, has been essentially de facto free agency in NCAA. And essentially just, again, giving the players the same kind of latitude that the coaches have had because the coaches have been able to move hither and fro whenever they get better opportunities over the years. Now the players are able to do the same thing. So, again, a couple things that we just thought we would never see. This last one, I, I think might have been inevitable at a certain point. I did think it would take longer to get to this point because we've only had the college football playoffs since 2014. And I have to say, again, I'm like the only person in America because I've liked having the bowl system. I like the fact that NCAA football, it might be the only major league anywhere in the world where the regular season is so important and any one game could knock a team out of championship contention. I always wanted the plus one system that we have now. You play semifinals, you play a championship. But inevitably, it's one of these things where you start it and it becomes bracket creep and it's 12 teams apparently going to be in the next system. And you know what? Hey, from there, if enough teams miss the tournament as the uh, third, what would have been the 13 seed or whatever, they'll probably go to you know, 16, 24, whatever the case may be. I mean, it, it, at this point, you can't put an end total on what this is going to be 100 years from now. I certainly wouldn't assume it would be limited to 12. But, uh, again, it, it's pretty radical because, uh, again, a decade ago, we were still in the, uh, the BCS system here where it was just two teams being picked to play at the end. We have a briefer period of time than I would have liked, historically, of four teams, because apparently that's only going to last a few more years. And then Brave New World, 12 teams, and going back full circle to what we were talking about before, you best believe this is going to benefit the mega conferences the most, the SEC and the Big Ten. Well, Rick, I mean, it wouldn't shock me, let's be honest with you, if they do expand the 12 teams, it wouldn't shock me if, if at least five five of those teams are from the SEC in the tournament. Exactly. I mean, it's going to be well, it's five, maybe six. Sure. I mean, you, you figure every pod winner in the SEC is going to make it. Uh, you know, it's going to be. And what's interesting, too, is and I haven't heard anybody talk about this anywhere on the conference thing. If you have four pods of four teams in these conferences here, uh, again, it, they're not going to add around in the conference here. It's just going to be the championship game. Who becomes the two pod winners? that play for the championship? Does it become the highest-ranking teams in the college football playoff, the highest-ranking pod uh, champions? Who knows? But it's going to be a thing where if you win a pod, any of the ones in the SEC, you're going to make it there. You're right. There's going to be another one or two at-large teams. Probably six of the, of the, of the 12 teams could end up coming from there. The Big Ten, they're going to have not necessarily all four pod winners, but the Big Ten, three or four teams, And it's a thing where, again, you're going to have the automatic spots in there for the Pac-12, the Big 12, if they uh, continue on in their present form, the ACC, and then the the, the group of five champion. 
But anybody that thinks that this could open the door to more than one group of five team, no. This is going to be like Ms. Pac-Man with the SEC, especially gobbling up all the remaining spots and to the lesser extent of Big Ten teams. I mean, right now, if they do get the 12 team, I see the only, the only conference group of five teams that's positioned to make the 12 is, is the American Athletic Conference. With the teams they have, the depth that they have, the coaches they have, that's the only I mean, team I can see you know, I mean, being in that top 12. I mean, as far as, you know, to make it, because the, the, the other group of five teams – very unlikely. I would agree. And, you know, you, you look at it, and it's a thing where I know it's not exactly apples to apples, because I was looking up about the academic standards of different schools, and I know that Utah rates uh, very highly as the Pac-12 was looking for, so they expanded to them, but Utah was previously, of course, a mid-major team. This might be a thing where the, the Pac-12, in terms of further expansion, they might want to swallow their objections on this, and maybe Boise State might want to take a look. I know they've been loyal to their conference, but if you're Boise and you're looking at it and, like, there's only probably still going to be one group of five team making it, and it probably won't be you because you're not coming out of the best group of five conference, one would think it could be in the best interest of both Boise and the Pac-12 to come to terms here because the Pac-12 gets another strong football team coming to a conference that uh, hasn't had enough of them, let's be perfectly honest. They've been aced out of the college football playoff most of the years. So that could be a win-win for both the school and the conference. And it definitely is correct. I have a question. What's your take on BYU? Do you think they should join the conference or all that religious stuff and their, and their crazy academic standards and everything else? Are they, or are they just going to remain in the See, here's the funny thing is that if you're them, I mean – for Notre Dame, it makes sense to be an independent because, again, if you place highly enough, if, you, if you've got a year with only, and it, 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 it's gross to me to talk about, you know, two lost teams or whatever being able to play for a championship because, like I said, we are just really watering down the regular season at this point. But if you're Notre Dame, you can pull it off. BYU, you've got to have a once-in-a-generation season like 84 uh, or uh, whatever the year was, I think it was '84 when they were able yeah. to uh, win the national championship playing in the Holiday Bowl. So it's it's a matter where, yeah, I mean, you would think maybe they want to be talking to the Pac-12 as well because again, right now Boise's a better football school than BYU, not historically, but Boise over the last 15 to 20 years is certainly a better school than BYU's been. But BYU is another school that could help ever so slightly bring up the standard of play in uh, the Pac-12. So, yes, that's an excellent question, Fran, and I think that's another one where it would make a lot of sense for both parties to be talking on that one. Well, Rick, it all comes down to uh, alumni. Whatever, they, whatever, uh, whatever can get them the most money possible, that's what it's about. And that's, and that's, and that's where if the, if the team gets in, um, joins another conference, it's about money. It's all, whatever, you can, whatever they can get the mo- make the most money with the TV deals, with sponsorships, with the alumni, uh, with, uh, and, the, uh, and, the other, and the other conferences, maybe travel things. But the thing is, it's all, it's all about the money. Uh, that's that's all. That's the only reason why another team's going to jump conference. The American Athletic Conference, none of those teams are going to jump. There's no reason. Their, their, position, their position right now, if they do span the 12, if they, you know, if they, if they you know, win their conference championship game, they have a very good shot at being that playoff. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, as, let's face it, schools like the AAC uh, schools, unless they're in position to jump to the SEC or the Big Ten, why bother? Or to a lesser extent, the ACC. None of them are, are I think, going to be poached in this climate. But it's a thing where the, for the Pac-12, for whatever remains of the Big 12, this whole thing of like being excluded from the playoff in years past, it's one of these things where the new exclusion is going to be, we only got one team in there. because And, and, and honestly, that's probably what's going to lead to, it'll go from 12 to 16 at a certain point, because... Again, the SEC is going to dominate it, the, the, the Big Ten. It's going to become a thing where most of the at-larges are going to go to them. And uh, really, the Pac-12 and the Big 12, in whatever form that it remains, and the rest of the mid-majors, they're just going to get one bit apiece. They're going to get the bare minimum under this new system because they're going to struggle to be competitive against the mega conferences when it comes to perception and everything else. I totally agree, Rick. And as far as... Oklahoma, Oklahoma will, will make the flows on a regular basis. They maybe every year, every other year in Texas, they, they're gonna have. It's gonna take time. It's gonna take. It's gonna take 
maybe three to four years of recruiting for them to to, to real uh, I mean to get where they were when, when Mac Brown was the coach when they did USC and the Rose Bowl for the National Championship. Absolutely, and it's a thing where it's so funny that Texas a couple of years ago, I mean, they really, really, really looked like they were on the come up in both uh, football and basketball. Uh, Tom Herman and uh, Shaka Smart coming in there, and uh, again, I, I'm still sort of at a loss as to why neither of them was able to elevate the program more, but you see what happened with, uh, with Herman, and one would think that for Shaka Smart, for his decision to bail and obviously take what a lot of people would consider to be a lesser job, it was probably like, you know, I saw what happened to my counterpart here. I better jump before they come and get me because that's the way that the standards are at that school. So, yes, uh, cyclically, Texas is at a point in both of their huge sports uh, where, again, they're digging out from the failed experiments of a couple of years ago, throwing big money at hot young coaches, and they were 0 for 2 on having it work out. And a fun start, right? They are Texas is three and seven against TCU. Their last ten games against them. So. Wow. Three well, and seven. they're not going to have uh, too many more coming up against TCU uh, over the years. I, I can't see and that one. Uh, and with the SEC teams beating up on each other, I mean, Rick, I'll be honest with you. I mean, a bunch of when they do it, get the twelve. I can see a three-loss SEC SEC team squeak in there based on based on trends. trends Easily. Kind of. Oh, easily you can see that. Yeah, there's going to be teams as sickening as it is to me as a traditionalist. There will be three lost teams in the playoffs. And again, the way they draw the pods, divisions, whatever you want to call them, is going to be fascinating. I think a lot of people are figuring at this point, and this is something ESPN would truly love for the SEC, now that they're taking over as the sole broadcaster for them in the next couple of years, is that uh, they will move to nine conference games. And what that would allow is you play everybody in your pod, you play another pod uh, in there, and then maybe half of another one. So every two years you would play the entire conference and you would make your way through on that. And it would be uh, you know pretty strong as far as uh, giving more of a unified feel to the conference. There's been some talk about if it's an eight-game conference schedule that you have a permanent opponent in the other uh, divisions that you would play, except for, I guess, the years you would play them, uh, you know, as you know, when you're playing that division, like say, for example, Tennessee and Vanderbilt, if they don't end up in the same division, they would probably end up being the historical rivals. Uh, and then I guess they'd each have to have a backup rival for the years that they played each other and on the regular schedule. But I think it's going to nine teams. I think that's what it's going to. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see. I think for most schools out there, I think you will see a matter of two essentially meaningless non-conference games and a lot of these schools loading up with one huge intersectional game to fit their 12-game schedule. Totally, totally agree, Rick. And as far as the conference championships, when I do get to 12, I'll be honest with you, Rick, I'm going to be watching the games, the ones where where the winner gets winning and you get in because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna it's game I'm not gonna waste my time watching a game where if the loser gets if the loser team loses they get in anyway. Yeah. So like when, like if undefeated Alabama plays um a one loss team in the SEC that game means nothing because they're both gonna get in and right? I yeah. I rather watch it I rather watch a game where a team an A C championship where you have to win to make the playoff. Fran, this this is an excellent thing. It's an excellent point that you, you bring up because I look at it, and I've talked about with uh, NCAA basketball, the meaningless nature of the regular season. Uh, and, uh, again, I go back to the first college basketball game ever to be played at Jerry World when it opened. 38,000 fans there, uh, Texas against the defending national champion North Carolina Tar Heels, and nobody cared. Uh, it was like if a tree falls in the forest and it doesn't make any noise. That's what we're heading towards because – so many of the conference championship games in March, like you said, are meaningless. It just becomes a matter of like, well, okay, let's see, uh, you know, uh, North Carolina, they're going to get higher seeded if they beat uh, Louisville here. So who cares? It's not win and you're out. It's moving college football towards the more meaningless. It'll never be as meaningless as the college football or college basketball regular season, but it's a huge step in that direction. And I don't like it. Now, again, Outside of the Big Ten and the SEC, I think we can agree in looking at this here, probably most of the rest of the conference championship games are going to be win and you're in. 
just because if you're not in one of the big two conferences, the way this landscape is morphing, then you're screwed. And, and also, there's nothing we have to keep in mind, Rick, as far as these uh, playoff games. I mean, I mean, uh, I, 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 I would assume they're going to have on the home field because if they don't, they're going to get killed. Because fans not fans have to uh, don't have to swallow money come travel all over the place to see games in person, especially in this pandemic world. And there's no guarantee. You know, to, you know, four or five years from now, people are, are going to, the economy is going to be better enough. People are not going to be able to travel from, oh, we'll go to Atlanta this week and then to um, Phoenix next week and then to Pasadena the following week. So, I mean, I would, I would honestly think that they do the playoffs. Maybe to, maybe once they get to the semifinals, they'll have neutral sites. But, uh, for, but from, a, from a money standpoint, people are not going to track, you know, on neutral sites. It's going to cost a fortune, right? Well, you know, and again, then this is the way that it's going, and this is a good note to bring it full circle on, because with what you're talking about there, I, I've seen it firsthand that uh, for my dad, who graduated from Ohio State, he has been a season ticket holder ever since he graduated, which is a long time. I'm not going to say how old my dad is, but that's a long time. And he may or may not even continue to get season tickets based on the way that it's going, the way that they're getting priced, that everything is getting escalated to where they are catering to, as you said, a smaller and more exclusive uh, group of ultra-elite, ultra-financially elite people here, and the ones who can afford to travel to what will be multiple rounds now of playoff games. And there is an assumption here, and I think this is a little bit like in the medium to long term, I think this is a Ponzi scheme. I think it's a, a, an assumption that there will always be more money there. Oh, the next contract with ESPN is even going to be bigger than this one. How do you know that? Because ESPN is still struggling to kind of evolve in a modern world. Look at a lot of the high-talent uh, people that they've slashed, a lot of the, the, the very talented on-air people they've had to let go in recent years for bottom-line issues. And as we're moving towards uh, such a streaming-type world in the future, I know they think they're doing pretty good now with the Disney bundle, but... There's a lot of questions about ESPN's model, business model in the years going forward. The more the sport leans on them, the more questionable it is. The more you uh, lean... So it, 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 it's say ESPN doesn't, you know, uh, is there anybody else at ESPN that would spend any money on this? Or has the capabilities or sure. networks to, to do this? I don't see Fox doing it. No, no, I, I, I don't either. I don't see NBC doing it. No. And um, the streaming services, people are not going to... Well, and that's the thing here, too, is that I would have thought by this point in time that uh, Amazon Prime would have been a bigger player in all of this, Netflix, etc. We just haven't seen it. Just the fact that uh, the Amazon Prime, uh, that they're going to be taking over the Thursday night NFL games a year from now, that feels pretty revolutionary in and of itself. Uh, but the fact that, uh, again, nobody's made a bigger splash to this point, or, or YouTube with Google, uh, they haven't chased any of these contracts. You can't assume that they're going to. So the notion that there's always going to be bigger TV revenue coming to sustain this more, more, more model, or, or that the uber elites in this country, all the trust fund kids, all the hedge fund guys, they're going to be able to, to, to pay for tickets to all these uh, huge playoff games and stuff like that. It's an assumption that I think is probably more of a house of cards than anything else, uh, Fran. I don't think they're going to solve. I feel you know, you know, like, especially with all the cord cutting. I mean, people. I mean, uh, all, all the uh, you know, all the streaming services. I only have I only have Netflix and Peacock. I can't afford. I mean, there's a million streaming services, and, and they always and they always try to give you something to to to, to make you want to sign up for it. Right. Like, like recently, they, South Park is going to have movies on Paramount Plus. I mean, I. I would never want to get Paramount Plus, but I love South Park. So it's good. I mean, wherever these, these like, you, like ESPN is going to try to add things, make it appeal to me to pick up ESPN Plus, which I don't want to spend six dollars a month, six, eight, six, eight dollars a month on. Exactly, and uh, you know, and that's the whole thing. And that this, this, we keep saying over the years, when is cable going to unbundle and move towards the a la carte model? Well. Streaming is already there. Streaming is already the a la carte model. It's it's this and this and this and whatever. And the cable companies want us to pay for that as well as their ongoing things, especially ones like Comcast uh, that actually own you know uh, and operate cable systems as well as Peacock. And uh, again, yeah, it's by the way the whole thing with Peacock too. And it's you know it's it's a fairly quality uh, thing here. And and I have a feeling, friend, that. Uh, you and I probably have it for much the same reason, which is that the WWE Network migrated there. 
But I find it to be a pretty decent service. But I'm telling you, the amount of, I'm not going to say necessarily outright false advertising, but the way they keep billing it is free, 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 free. Well, Fran, let's be real. It's only guys like me and you that are subscribing on one of the two tiers that are seeing everything they have there. There's a lot of misleading advertising out there. Yeah, they got some free stuff here, and you can watch The Office for free a handful of, of episodes. Most of it's behind the paywall. So their, their advertising probably pisses a lot of people off because it's misleading at best. Unfortunately, when you get into something, you get stuck with a minute commercial. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So you, you have all of that in there uh, as well. So all this is to say, again, medium to long term, the college football world is going to face some challenges here because the, the unifying theme, the through line of everything we're talking about today is more, 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 more. As far as the athletes now getting paid, as far as the mega conferences getting bigger and everyone else struggling to keep up, and as far as the expanded playoff and all the extra games and all the extra moolah that they think is somehow going to anesthetize losing the regular season. It's going to be a sad situation where if it's just the lead teams dominating every year. I mean, even when they expand expanded the 12, for, for a good part, it's going to be teams that are typically typically successful on the field. And maybe once in a blue moon, you might get a, you know, a Cinderella out there, but it's going to be teams that dominate, right? And it's going to be, it might even be boring. Yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to have the appeal to, Watch these first round games. If I have other things to do. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna dedicate you know weeks on, on end watching college football playoff games. Well, and and let's be completely honest, Fran. And again, and you you and I are traditionalists uh, as far as what we grew up on and what we've appreciated. And I know you've appreciated a lot of the same things I have over a period of time. Let's be perfectly honest. Whatever remains of the college bowl system at this point is now officially the equivalent of the NIT. That's basically it. It's it's a consolation prize at best, and a lot of schools won't even regard it as being that way. A lot more players are going to sit out of bowl games. It's just going to destroy whatever's left of the bowl system. And I know guys like me and you grew up with a lot of great memories watching those games. And Rick, and, 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 and I agree. I, mean, I, I, tend to walk, I, I tend to try to watch towards every single bowl game. And let's say hypothetically this does happen, the small conferences that don't get to the college football playoff should do their own playoff. I mean, just to, because we had a Liberty, we had a, a, a Liberty Coastal Carolina matchup. That was the best game of the bowl season. So that's the only way it can work if you're gonna, if, you, if you're not gonna be in the playoff. But get the best from those small conferences, right? You know what, friend? You're, I, I tell you what, I, I'm gonna take my hat off to you uh, uh, here at the very end. You, you have come up with an idea I haven't heard before, but that I think is brilliant. Is you know what? If the bowls are gonna be the equivalent of the NIT then just make an NIT tournament. I completely agree with you. Just just let them play multiple games, let them advance, let there be another you know uh, championship uh, going on parallel to this one. You might as well. You might as well give them something to play for. Definitely. Uh, like I say, Rick, I mean, it, it's funny. You said we were going to do this podcast like you know, 15, 20 minutes, but then I, I, kept, I kept on bringing up so many good points, and you kept on... And good facts, and it worked out really well. Well, it, it did, and and that's anytime you try and put a target on it uh, here, it's always going to be a low one as far as an estimate. But that's fine, buddy. It's it's much better to pack in as much good stuff as you can and give the people more. So uh, that is something that is a constant whenever you are on French Stuckberry. Uh, as it, uh, you always bring more and deliver more. Appreciate that so much. Love checking out your stuff at Our Sports Central and the other fine outlets that you write for. Thank you so much for your time, as always, Frank. And thanks, Rick. Another thing I, I constantly hear about you, your FDH round, FDH rounds. If you're down with FDH round, I have three words for you. Listen to it. <laughs> there you go, buddy. And uh, also, we will send a shout out as we're taping this uh, here today. And we talk about memories that we have. I know you and I probably have a lot of great memories of arguably the greatest tag team wrestler of all time, beautiful Bobby Eaton. So, RIP to Bobby Eaton, the past guest of the show that we are so fortunate to have on. Uh, a wonderful man, a great uh, pro wrestler, somebody that brought a lot of entertainment to me and you over the years. Yeah, he definitely did the Midnight Express. Get him in the Hall of Fame eventually, right? Um, 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 Vince McMahon, get him in the Hall of Fame. Yes, yes, they should be, and uh, they absolutely should. And uh, anybody out there, go watch some beautiful Bobby Eaton matches, Midnight Express uh, or, or any of the other 
uh, entities that he was under. Him and Arn Anderson as a great tag team with a dangerous alliance. Uh, even him and uh, you know, Stephen Regal with the Blue Bloods. Uh, go, go watch some Bobby Eaton stuff. It'll put a smile on your face. Best tribute you could possibly give to him. So once again, thank you so much, Fran Stuckberry, and thank you everybody for checking out FDH Lounge mini episode 1360.